everyone, it's Mikey Chen. Now, pardon me if I sound a bit off because I'm still trying to get over a cold. And speaking of colds, if I go to the doctors today about my common cold, they'll probably prescribe me some medicine or just tell me to go home and get some rest. But that's probably not what would have happened if I had a cold and went to the doctors, say, in the Middle Ages. So I'm really glad that we have come a long way from the violent torture chamber-esque ways that illnesses used to be assessed and treated. I mean, seriously, back in the day, doctors were doing things in the name of of medicine that today would be considered a violent felony. Now some of these are a bit graphic, so if you're eating something, maybe stop because it's not going to taste very good coming back up. Number one, the cure for stuttering. This technique for treating stuttering was pioneered in the mid 1800s by German surgeon Johann Friedrich Diffenbach, who apparently ran the surgical department at Castle Wolfenstein. Diffenbach believed that stuttering was caused by spasms in the voice box that resonated up the length of the tongue, and those spasms could be interrupted by making a horizontal incision at the root of the tongue and taking out a triangular wedge across it. This procedure, called a hemi glossectomy. By the way, sectomy means to surgically remove, so whenever you hear a word with that in it, you know it can't be good. In this case, hemiglossectomy is the removal of a portion of the stutterer's tongue, and by a portion, I mean about half. Diffenbach went on to perform this surgery on hundreds of patients across Germany and France, despite the fact that his results were completely unsubstantiated, and a significant portion of his patients bled to death. And if that's not terrifying enough, imagine actually a agreeing to this procedure than going into the doctor's office to have it done without any anesthetic by the way and the doctor walks in with freddy krueger's office equipment yeah this is actually what the doctors use to perform this procedure i think at that point no matter how bad my stuttering is i think i'll live with it you might find it interesting to know that this procedure is still used today but doctors now use it to remove cancerous growths and they actually dull your pain beforehand number two treating hemorrhoids during the middle ages if a person person did not pray to Saint Fiacra, who was known as the patron saint for hemorrhoid sufferers and gardeners, they would suffer, of course, hemorrhoids, also known as Saint Fiacra's curse. And if you were one of those unlucky sufferers, you'd be sent off to the monks who would chant scriptures and pray for your good health. Uh, you wish? Actually, just the opposite. They're gonna take a iron rod, heat it up till it's glowing red, then they're gonna stick it up your bum. Now, if you're wondering why a hot iron rod up your behind is the opposite of gentle prayers, it just is. But rejoice, there is a less painful alternative. If you don't want the hot iron rod option, then you would be sent to sit on St. Fiacre's famous rock, the spot where the 7th century Irish monk was miraculously cured of his hemorrhoids. So basically, some rock where a lot of people with hemorrhoids have sat. Awesome. By the 12th century, things have gotten a lot better when a Jewish physician prescribed something much simpler a good soak in a bath. Number three, kids coughing. Bayer is mostly associated with aspirin these days, but in the 1920s, the German drug giant advertised heroin, which of course is known today as one of the most addictive substances in the world. But Bayer marketed it as a cough remedy for children. Bayer paid for advertisements in various places around the world that promoted heroin as a fine treatment for children who were suffering from sore throats, colds, coughs, and so forth, with the images depicting kids reaching for the bottle of heroin or being spoon-fed by their parents. People finally started to catch on to the fact that the use of heroin to treat coughs led to a gradual addiction, no duh, when many flocked to their local pharmacies to try to obtain more and more of the stuff. The US government finally decided that maybe it should be available only by prescription only. Of course, they waited until 1914 to do this, meaning that there was a 15-year window in which you could just easily go to your local pharmacy and get Get some smack. Ultimately, in 1924, the FDA decided that making it a prescription drug wasn't enough, so it was banned altogether. Number four, teeth whitening. Before whitening strips, something else was used to whiten teeth in ancient Rome, something free and everyone can have access to. Pee. When left out for a long time, urine decomposes into ammonia, which is a great cleaning product, so why not just stick that into your mouth? And it wasn't just human pee. Roman poets like Catullus attest to people using both human and animal pee as a mouth rinse that helped whiten their teeth. So the next time you're complaining that the Listerine is burning and you cannot hold out for those 60 seconds, just remember, 
could have been Pete. I'm actually thinking that's how Listerine should just advertise their products from now on. You guys remember those Listerine commercials where they're trying to convey to you that really it's it's worth it for that nice clean mouth feeling? Keep it up. Don't whip out now. There. See? You can handle it. You know what? Forget all that. They should just change everything to it could have been Pete. Anyway, the Romans used so much urine that Emperor Vespasian even imposed a urine tax. That's right. Attacks on P. Number five, bloodletting. For thousands of years, medical practitioners clung to the belief that sickness was merely the result of apparently a Taylor Swift song. Researchers believe bloodletting began with the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians and became common practice during the rise of Greece and Rome. Influential physicians maintained that the human body was filled with four basic substances or humors: yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood, and these needed to be kept in balance to maintain proper health. With this in mind, when treating everything from a sore throat to a fever to the plague, doctors would simply cut open a vein and drain some of their patient's blood. In some cases, leeches were even used to suck the blood directly from the skin. This practice was common well into the 19th century and only fell out of favor after new research showed that it might be doing more harm than good. You know, maybe all ancient doctors were a bit uh, vampire-ish, cause that's a pretty clever scheme. I'm sorry, but to cure your disease, we need to take some of your blood. Wait, doc, I just came in because I had dandruff. Wait, did you say dandruff? Then we're gonna need this and this. Number six, the Babylonian skull cure. For the ancient Babylonians, most illnesses were thought to be the result of demonic forces or punishments by the gods for something bad that you did. So doctors were more like priests and exorcists, and their cures usually involved some sort of magic. For example, if a patient ground their teeth, the healer might suspect that the ghost of a deceased family member was trying to contact them as they slept, cause that's so obvious. Then the cure would be to sleep by a human skull for a week to exercise the spirit. And to make sure this Hellraiser prescribed treatment worked, the patient was also instructed to kiss and lick the skull seven times each night. Number seven, the cannibal method. Do you suffer from persisting headaches, muscle cramps, or stomach ulcers? Well then, maybe you need a good old magical elixir with a dash of human flesh, blood, or bone. The so-called corpse medicine was a disturbingly common in practice for hundreds of years. The Romans believed that the blood of fallen gladiators could cure epilepsy. 12th century apothecaries were known for keeping a stock of mummy powder, which were basically ground up mummies looted from Egypt. Also, in the 17th century, King Charles II was known for enjoying a drink of king's drops, which is basically a drink made out of crumpled human skull and alcohol. These cannibalistic medicines were thought to have magical properties. Basically, by consuming the remains of a deceased person, the patient is thought to ingest part of their spirit, leading to increased vitality and well-being. What's even more creepy is the type of cure prescribed usually corresponded to the type of ailment. For example, skull was used for migraines, human fat for muscle aches. You know, I would hate to be that person who had eye problems. So yeah, the next time your doctor wants to give you a shot or tell you to stay in bed for a few days, it's good to know that at least they're not draining your blood or giving you dead people to eat. Alright guys, thank you so much much for watching. If you liked this video, please hit that like button. And again, sorry about my voice. Maybe I need to go drink some smack or go kiss a skull or something. Thanks again. See you later.